Are we good? All right. Thank you, Ms. Pam, and your team, and your vision for what you're doing. And uh, here in a week, next week, we'll be voting on whether to accept uh, Loving Hearts for Africa is our is one of our missions that we support. And so uh, think about that, and you'll see a, a little voting slip next week for voting members. Okay, as Ms. Pam said, uh, the church should be involved with missions and going out and sharing the gospel of Christ with others. Uh, and we talked about that a little bit this morning in how do we share the gospel of Christ with others. Uh, do you have a hope within you? Do you have a hope? Do you have a vision of your future? of your destiny? Do you have a vision for glory? Uh, and is that just for you? Or is that for you and those you know and love? Uh, and how do you pursue that hope or that vision? This morning, I'm going to share briefly just a little bit about uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, the subtitle of this would be Looking Forward and hastening the day. Looking forward and hastening. What do you look forward to? You know, as Miss Pam shared, and we know this from our other mission fields, uh, lots of the citizens of a specific mission field, uh, for example, Africa, Panama, Haiti, uh, China, Siberia, uh, they all look forward to surviving the day just getting through the day. Parents look forward to getting through the day and going one, two, three, and counting kids and ending up in the morning with the same number of kids that they went to bed with. Uh, that they look forward to a meal at school. If you've ever served children who their only meal is at school, it's amazing. It's amazing. I saw little, little guys, okay, five and six years old and if they could have had a shovel to eat with they would have used it they would put food in and I'm going where are you big plates of uh, rice and plantain and different things and they would just shove and there wasn't a grain of rice missing because that's all they were getting that day and so uh, we do take things for granted yeah, right. This time of year when we plan Thanksgiving feasts, I always think of those people. Okay? I think of those kids. Right? I still feast. Okay? I still have big plates of food and that kind of thing. Uh, but we're blessed with that. God has blessed us with that. So I don't take anything back from, from God. Whatever God d decides to bestow on us, amen. Amen. And what can we bestow on others then? on others. Uh, we are thankful, of course, for our salvation. I'm delighted to see that the school has, obviously, uh, Bibles in there, gospel message being planted there, and that's crucial, crucial in those countries. And so I'm thankful for that. Uh, and so by way of introduction this morning, I want you to turn, if you wouldn't mind, into the Gospel of Luke chapter 2. There's a very interesting event that occurs, and you're familiar with it. We talk about it uh, every uh, Christmas season. Uh, I'll address it later on toward Christmas a little bit. But I want you to address and look at people who attend church, if, and I'm going to make a, a parallel here. Hopefully I'm going to make a parallel. Okay, People who attend church... Uh, and what they're attending is they're looking forward to something. That's why they're here. Hopefully that's why you're here. You're looking forward to something. Okay? And you would want it to be today. Maybe it's today. And so in Luke chapter 2, in verse 36, there's a lady. And uh, this lady, and it says in verse 36, there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanel, 
of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with a husband seven years after her marriage, and then as a widow to the age of 84. And she never left the temple, serving night and day with fasting and prayers. And at the very moment she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak of him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Uh, there was a lady. We would call her an elder citizen. Every day. And so at the temple. So I'm just going to pull that over to the church every day in the church and she is looking for something she's looking for the redemption of Jerusalem of the city of the people of Jerusalem the redemption the purchase the deliverance the salvation of her city and so what happens is she attends church kind of like normal just I'm coming here, I'm serving, I am, and we'll talk about here in just a second her attitude of service. But the reason that she's actually involved with this situation is another fella, an elderly fella. And uh, what happens is, and just you back up to verse 25, and there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout. Now look, he's looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. So here is a statesman, a, a believer, and he's looking for the, consul the redemption of Israel, of a nation. So on one side of the church, you have an elderly statesman, a congregant, if you will, a believer, looking for the deliverance and the uh, redemption of their whole nation, of the United States of America, if you will. But on the other side of the congregation, there's an elderly lady, Christian lady. She's looking for the redemption of the city in which they live. And that is being accomplished by one person. And it is because Joseph and Mary have brought Jesus into the temple. And verse 26, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see, the, see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if before you died you saw Christ, you saw the redemption? Now how the Holy Spirit translates that to Simeon, I don't know. Whether he has this chat with him or a letter or an email or a text, I'm not sure. Okay, but Simeon knows, you know what? I'm going to see the deliverer before I die. Uh, we talked last week about our deliverer, 1 Thessalonians 4, the Christ, our Christ, the Redeemer, coming for his church, right? Descending into the clouds, and then we who are alive are caught up, caught up, brought to be with him, and there we will be forever and brought into glory. And that's what we look forward to. We look forward to our final redemption. And in fact, the redemption of mankind. So you might be sitting here and saying, you know what? I'm looking for the, my redemption, my redeeming, my translation, my resurrection. That's what I'm looking forward to. And oh, what a glory that will be. And somebody right beside you is thinking, you know what? I'm looking for that for my whole family. My whole family. I want to all go together. Have you ever had that conversation? Mm -hmm. Hey, we're going to die. Okay, well, let's go together. Right? Uh, I think that would be such a wonder. Such a wonder if we're gathered and we leave together. Uh, so Simeon has that attitude. Anna has that attitude. What a great attitude to have in the church. That we are serving and glorifying God and looking forward, both of them, looking forward to the consolation. He came in the spirit to the temple, verse 27. His parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law. And he, this is Simeon, took him, this is Jesus, into his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Can you imagine bringing your child to church, the little infant child, 
just a, less than a week old, and one of the elder citizens in the church, a Christ follower, grabs your child, holds him up in the air. And I think he's holding him up in the air. I don't think he's cloaking him. I think he's held him up. And he is pray and I don't think he's saying this silently to himself. He is saying this out loud to everyone around. Look at him. He is here. You promised I would see him. So I think everybody around is going, what's he doing? Who's that kid he's holding up? And why is he holding him up? My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people. He makes these statements and Joseph and Mary, verse 33, his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. And so now Simeon turns to them and speaks to them. And as he's doing that, the lady from across the, the high, uh, aisle way, okay, the one on the other side of the church, if you will, he see, she sees Simeon doing that. She sees Mary and Joseph. She sees him talking to them. If you were waiting to see Jesus, and there he is, wouldn't you go over there? Say, well, I'll see him next week. You know, he'll be here. No. She is looking forward and expecting and hastening that day. And when she sees Simeon hold him up, she, she just burns over there, I think. She might get in a wrestling match with Simeon over Jesus, right? I always kind of picture that, right? And she is so excited, as we just read. She came up. She's giving thanks to God. Thank you, God, for salvation. For our city, for our nation, for individuals. Thank you, God. You come for us. As we wait, then Anna, this devout, I'll call her a Christian lady, was looking for the redemption of Jerusalem, the redemption of Israel, the deliverer. And in fact, it's because she's already redeemed. She just doesn't know it yet. She hasn't personally met Jesus. But she's fixing to. If I said to you, hey, you don't want to miss next week, because you know what? Jesus himself is going to be right here. And you'd go, no, he ain't. No, really, he's going to be right here. No, no, he's not really going to be there. You see, and that's what people think in the church. And that's a sad looking forward. The Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ is here every week. Every week. Every day of the week. His sanctuary. You enter into holy ground, if you will. Wow. The king is here. His spirit is here. God is here. You know who else is here? Who else is here? And it is angels. God's holy angels look, they look into our worship. We don't have time to, to go there, but perhaps this week I, or this month I will. They're watching you to see how you worship him, the king. How do you do that? How's this praise and worship go? What's the preparation? What have you done to prepare yourself in this looking forward? Well, Anna did three things as far as I can see. Number one... <clears throat> She was a constant figure in the church in service, serving. She showed up, not just on Sunday or the Sabbath, if you will. She showed up every day. Every day. In fact, the inclination is that she lived in the church. I don't know. Maybe they had a little room off to the side where people could live along the temple wall there. She wasn't leaving. I rather think it's because she didn't want to miss it. And since she was there, you know, I'm here, why don't I go ahead and serve? Minister to others. Serve others. When you came in this morning, did you expect to be here and serve others? Or did you expect to be served? 
Most people who enter a church enter with an empty basket to see what will be, what God will fill them up. Will He do? And I understand soldiers out working in the, the war in the world today. Wow, powerful. And sometimes you need a bit of a rest break. And so you come back to get rest, to get ammo, to be rearmed, to be refreshed. And I understand all of that. But you are a contributor. You are a server. And that's what Anna is. She is a great illustration of that faithful service for years in the church. The second thing that she's doing in looking forward, these are all looking forward, is fasting. Fasting. She's giving up something she normally partakes of, giving up something that she's normally a part of. Normally it's food, but she gives that up so that she can hear from God. Fasting is an act of service to God looking forward. Uh, we practice fasting here typically in the spring. Uh, and we look at that. And I always say, if you want to see what controls you, right, what substance controls you, then you just give it up. Give up coffee for a month. Try not to have too many people around you. I've had during fasting times, Pastor, I gave up coffee. I just can't understand it. All the people around me are so nasty. <laughs> give up chocolate for a month. Donuts. Okay? Just pick whatever your favorite thing is. And you'll find out instantly, well, a day, right, what controls you and how it controls you. And that's the great part about fasting, is that you can look at substances and go, whoa, I am being dominated by a world of substances. And I'm going to lay that down at the foot of the cross, and I'm going to glorify God, even if I don't have what my belly wants, or my tongue wants, fasting. And thirdly, she devotes looking forward to in prayer. She's going to talk to God. What do you suppose Anna's prayers were? I have to think that at least some of them were because she's looking for the redemption of Jerusalem, that that's part of her prayer. Lord, I would love to see the Savior. I would love to see the King. I would love to see the Redeemer. The same as Simeon. That's what they're looking forward to. I've met Jesus. I pray that you have too. I gave my life to him. It was not a, a, uh, a road situation where I was suddenly tramping along on the road, became blind, hit the dirt. Okay? Not that. But just as powerful, Christ spoke to me, lovingly called me to him. I accepted the invitation. I gave my life to Christ. And it's never been the same since. And I grow all the time, every day, in Him. In Him, The day had arrived. He was there at the temple. To those who were looking forward to His coming, it was a great day of celebration. The rest of the people missed it. Missed it. Because these weren't the only two people in the temple. But you see, there's others, okay? As they're doing that, there's others that are going, Whoa. Friends of Anna, friends of Simeon. And so they would gather around. I, I just have to believe there was many other people gathered there. Are there other people gathered looking forward as you? Turn down the road to Second Peter if you wouldn't mind. It's clear to the right quite a ways in your New Testament. Pertin you're out of the New Testament. Peter writes about faithful Christian service. He writes about people that are doing what God asked them to do. He also is being prophetic. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11. Now, you should actually read the, the whole of this uh, book of 2 Peter. It's, not, it's only three chapters long. Okay? Uh, but in verse 11, and I'm kind of skipping ahead a lot, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, 
What kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. Look at verse 12. In the NASB as it says, uh, Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. And I want to focus on that for just a moment. 2 Peter 3.12 if you have the NIV, it says, as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. The NASB, which I just read, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. The King James Version says, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. If you have a modern translation, you are going to find that Peter is exhorting us as servants of God to look forward and hasten. Hasten the day. Looking forward. I look forward to it, not knowing when it may occur. Uh, I have a belief that it will occur. The coming of God for His church, I believe that's going to happen. I believe that with every part of my being. And I believe it will occur. I don't believe it has occurred. Because number one, y'all are still here. See, now if I'm still here, okay, right? But man, if you're not, if you're still here, I am a pitiful preacher. I look forward, I understand this day will occur. And the condition of mind in which we would not be taken by surprise, should it happen at any moment, we should not be surprised. I think we will be, but I don't think we should be surprised when we hear Michael shout out, He's here! And then you hear the trumpet of God, you go, what's that? I think when Michael shouts out, we're going to know what's that. And then, around us, and it would be a wonderful transition if we were all standing in a graveyard. <laughs> Wouldn't that be amazing? Because the dead in Christ, 1 Thessalonians 4, will rise first, physically. And we, Christ followers, are going to see it. Those without Christ, I don't believe they can see this. They're not going to see this. Now what they may see is a bunch of holes suddenly in the, the graveyard. Might come to work and say, man, we've had a mass of uh, uh, graveyard uh, uh, diggers come in here to steal. But we're going to see it. And I share this, if I do an internment service... Okay, internment, we're placing somebody in a, a mausoleum of some type or actually burying them or whatever. I always quote those verses out of 1 Thessalonians because a lot of people think, okay, they're going in the ground, that's it. Okay, it's done, it's over, Uncle Bob is in the dirt. Okay, we'll come and place flowers. Well, if Uncle Bob is a Christ follower, this is not the end. Amen? Amen? This is just merely the beginning. Uncle Bob's not here. First and foremost, if he's a Christ follower, he's there to be absent from the body, to be present with Christ. Amen. I look forward to that. And so when Uncle Bob is put in the dirt, people go, oh, he's still there. All right. No, he's not. His body is. But then I tell him, there will be a day. It's called a resurrection day. When the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ for his church, graves all over this cemetery will be opened up and they will become alive more than they've ever been in their entire being. Their body will join with their soul, their spirit, who they are in his presence. In his presence. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up with those in the clouds. And I think, well, cool. I had a dream about this. Here's how it looked. So this is probably scriptural. <laughs> All of a sudden, I was at a specific place in a specific work center, which that's the part that baffles me now. Okay? I wasn't at the church. And suddenly it was like beams of light all over the countryside and up I was going. And I was going, whoa, it's here. And you could see beams of light and people all over going. <laughs> kind of like the Star Trek thing. Maybe I was watching too much Star Trek. I don't know. Okay. Uh, but I, I do remember I was excited. 
I was amazed. I wasn't bewildered. I wasn't sitting there not looking for it. Uh, hastening means to hasten after is that I await with eager desire. The true Christian does not dread the coming of that day. He looks forward to it as a period of his redemption and would welcome at any time the return of the Lord and Savior because your feet are planted in glory, not on earth. Your heart is planted in glory, not on earth. And you look forward to that. What a privilege, what an honor it is. Now just think about that you're a little kid in Uganda in school. And you've never heard any of that. And you don't know that. And your parents, they don't know it, so they couldn't possibly teach it to you. They don't have a Bible, so they couldn't possibly know or teach it, other than a direct revelation of God, which God, Christ Jesus does. Okay? But perhaps it is, <clears throat> I'm going to school so I can get a big old plate of rice and beans. Right? That's why they're there. See, they come to get. And I applaud that. I'm grateful that there's rice and beans for them to come to. But then they also, at one point in their education, they see, here's a Bible. What's that? And so they learn about the Bible. Then they learn about Jesus Christ. Then they learn about salvation. Wouldn't you want that? Don't we want that? For all the kids in the world. And we do. And that's why we support missions. That's why we ask loving hearts to come and present today to us. Because we are looking forward and I want those kids to look forward. And I pray that you do too. Amen.